Um, I showed it earlier in the show, but just in case you weren't part of the show, this is a expert panel report on the July violence Zoom apocalypse. I really like, I really like that. <laughs> SA's damage far deeper than the hundred billion wiped out by a single man's legacy. So basically, a report came out about the July riots, and the question was, who's really responsible here? And, I mean, a lot of figures are in here, a lot of, you know, uh, recap of what happened, and some things were aired about the police, and disappoint disappointing uh, facts are, are now being released in this in this uh, article, I did pass it on to my panelists so they can have a quick read through. Even if you didn't, I mean, you, if you just stayed close to this story, you, you would know what what's going on. But um, basically, in a nutshell, everything is a mess. Uh, Saps is a mess. Everyone's pointing at each other. The, 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 the Minister of Security, the Minister of Defense, the, the Becky Tele, they're all pointing at each other, blah, blah, blah. All this report, in my opinion, and I'll give you guys a chance to, to give your opinion, in my opinion showed is that everything we're seeing right now is, is the fault of the ANC. This, this riot, they tried to pin it on Zuma. Whether you can pin it on Zuma like a portion of it, but the entirety of it, the destruction, the billions lost, all the businesses destroyed in KZN, uh, even, even the Phoenix incident afterwards, I mean, that was like a, a splinter of what, of, what these, of what happened during these riots. Everything goes back to the ANC and the failures of Cyril Ramaphosa and his, his government, the ANC. Um, that's what I'm going to say in a nutshell. I'll let uh, Dodgy go first on this one. Dodgy? What do you think about this this report and the uh, KZN riots? Well, okay, so first, the, I didn't read too much about the report. I read the, the other article that we linked into, into the group. Um, but to call it a, a single man's legacy is a bit, I think a, it's a bit of a, of jumping the shark moment here. Um, because let's, let's also remember that it's more a concerted effort of individuals in key positions to allow this to happen, right? Um, they're just as guilty as, as Zuma or, or whoever wanted to capture the state in this regard. Um, furthermore, with what the riots basically showed us and what this report shows us is that there's a, an intrinsic network of almost tactical urban warfare sort of um, insurgents in, in South Africa when things do not turn out in favor of specific individuals, which is very dangerous. And I think this is an element that, that needs to be addressed. Um, is Cyril doing that? I don't know. I'm not seeing any any movements on it. But I did hear whispers that the NPA um, has started to, to compile reports and stuff and will probably start prosecuting these. But this is up to the, the head of the of the NPA to actually pursue or not. Um, after which maybe he or she would need to give their reasons to Parliament, um, hopefully. So yeah, we'll see. That that's at least my my thoughts on that. Koketsa. Yeah, I mean, I didn't read the whole article, but maybe if I can just touch on the headline, the one hundred billion rand loss. Yeah, it's very difficult to quantify. Or let me let me rather say this, right? We'll never know the real loss, right? In that one hundred billion rand is probably uh, property and asset damage, etc. But the real loss is in the sales manager who was working really hard on a business deal of some sort to bring in more business for their company. That's lost revenue. Um, that's a loss, you know. The real loss is in uh, the investment that was that may or may not have been on the way. The real loss is in the ability to go to potential investors and then say, hey, come invest in my country, my community, uh, my infrastructure, etc. The real loss is there too. The real loss is in people who have lost their jobs and again, having very limited prospects for a job in the first place, losing your place of employment, not losing your employment, losing your place of employment is actually an even bigger, it's an even bigger thing because you're basically cut twice by the same knife. You know, the real loss is in potential for people to actually upskill themselves and gain work experience because there isn't a workplace that was there before. You know, the real loss is in the perception of the country where 
you have to almost work twice as hard now to convince even locals to not just invest in business in the area affected, etc., but for professionals who are working in there who are maybe thinking of emigrating and decided, you know what, let me stay here. And now the July riots have kind of exacerbated the whole situation and guys are making active decisions to leave the country along with their skills and, of course, their uh, they tax re they, yeah they, they they tax money, you know that's the real loss. And no matter how anyone, be it government or the media, tries to paint this, or you know comes back and says right a year later these are the lessons learned, or the president coming in again with you know by greeting the nation in six seven different languages and giving a very warm speech about how something like this will never happen again none of that is going to wipe out the real loss and we can never measure that real loss unfortunately for people's easy reading or to make it as palatable as possible to a wider audience uh, there has to be you know someone has to take the fall and in this case it's very easy to say uh, to mention the zuma word and just say it was a zuma thing etc you know that's the easy way out you know the real the real people to blame here is government for not having a police service that could effectively respond efficiently and effectively to the growing outrest. Like you mentioned, Joe, uh, the real uh, the real villain here also is our leaders who, you know, instead of telling people to say, guys, do not break the law. You had guys actively saying that, right, uh, they are condoning what was happening because, again, factionalism with the a within the ANC. They didn't come out and actually condone this. They actually just came out and said, this is the fault of Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, who did X, Y, and Z. You know, So it's not about the destruction and the damage. They rather said, no, let's rather paint, pin this on DCJ Zondo instead of saying that, guys, we've got a community here we've got something here that is worth protecting they didn't actually go ahead and do that and that says a lot more about them than the people who are then in an about turn accused of something like racism for deciding to stand up for their family their business their community etc it is very disappointing to see as a south african that my countrymen are of this mindset it's not a building mindset it's one of saying vengeance and revenge for my friends being persecuted for what i believe is not the right thing or for what i believe is their innocence that's the mentality of south africans so how do you effectively take that mentality and say let's build a country and move forward objectively it's impossible but i still have hope i think we all should have hope uh, to some extent Koketsa. Uh, it's very important but then again some people will say hope is for losers um <laughs> yeah um sunflower uh and then and then xavier xavier i know you have a lot to say which is why i'm i'm, I'm leaving you for last on this one um but uh sunflower just very quickly i, I can't remember you got it cut off earlier so I, was, I wasn't sure if you were with us but um basically the uh, quick question are you do you live in kzn no okay but um, i don't really want to reveal where exactly i live no, 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 no. Because uh, after yeah. our initial discussion, the EFF might just be <laughs> trying to hunt me down. <laughs> no, I don't live in KZN. I'm, 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 uh, I'm between provinces. Okay, that's fine. Um, I was just curious uh, because uh, if you, if you, if you said yes, then I would have asked like what your experience was during the KZN riots. But oh, oh, oh no. I, well, when when the July unrest happened, I was actually in KZN at the time. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah, I was in KZN at the time, and I clearly remember that when the trucks were being burnt on the N2, I think it was on a Friday and a Saturday, and I remember saying to my partner that, um, you know, there are reports of, uh, you know, of a potential shutdown on the Monday, and he still said to me, you know, this is, you know, you're, you're imagining things, not, none of this is going to actually happen, and I said to him, because, you know, he lives in, in well, we're here, we're, we're in KZN um, for a period of time. <laughs> we're in KZN for a period of time. And we were in Amshlanga at the time. And I said to him, look, if, if there is going to be anything, I actually want to be with my parents. Um, I don't really want them to be alone. So on that Monday morning, um, when the riots broke out, 
I said to him, I'm actually going to risk it and I'm going to get onto whatever that road is called where you pass Nandi Drive. I'm sorry, I'm geographically challenged when it comes to places, but I know that I got to pass Nandi Drive to get to my folks. And I remember getting onto that road. I even took a video and I had never seen a road that or that road that quiet in my entire life. That road's busy. If anyone knows that road, it is busy. Um, and when I finally got to, I think it was, um, there's a, there's a township on, I, I just can't get the name of the township. I actually stopped where the cops were. And I said to them, is it safe for me to take the off ramp to my folks? And the, and the cop just said to me, just get out of here. Just get out of here. Just go. Don't even stop. And on either side of the roads, there were bricks. There were people walking with hockey sticks, pangas, stones. Um, there were tires burning on the road and I didn't tell my parents that I was actually coming, you know, I was coming to them because I didn't want them to get scared and, and be afraid and tell me not to. Um, so, you know, by God's grace, obviously I'm here. So that means I did get home safely. Um, so that that was very, that was freaky because you got to take the Kwamashu off ramp, which is like, I think, um, and Phoenix is not very far from the Kwamashu off ramp. So that was my experience. I still have videos of it. Um, I haven't read the report. What I want to know though, is that you know we keep pinning this blame on on the government Cyril Ramaphosa uh, I mean the, this entire unrest that happened we eventually pinned the entire thing on Phoenix residents right but nobody actually said well what happened to the to the people that died in in Johannesburg how did they die Phoenix residents didn't kill them they died because of their own negligence. Whether you like to believe it or not, the truth is the truth. They died because of their negligence. The people that died in Phoenix, okay, let's let's park that for a second or so. What happened to the people who died in Peter Maritzburg? Um, I think there was a story about three people that were uh, that locked themselves up in a storeroom and they froze to death. Um, somewhere else, I think it was a macro in Peter Maritzburg, if I'm not mistaken. Um, some guys burnt themselves to death. That happened in the CBD as well. Phoenix residents were not involved. Now, I'm not going to sound biased here. There were people that were instigated in Phoenix to exacerbate the violence. Okay. Um, that could have been Indian people as well. I mean, I read a little story, whether this is a rumor or not, but I'm going to put it out there that um, there's an Indian security company that is has very close ties to president jacob or former president jacob zuma and they were paid to actually fuel the violence so where you had innocent people trying to protect their homes you also had people on the other side in you know just fueling this violence now how do you separate the two it's impossible because an indian is an indian it doesn't really matter you can say this gangster indian um, attacked me and then you can say this innocent Indian attacked me. Now they were they were videos and I have a lot of those videos. They were posted on my timeline as well. People in Chatsworth, I mean I have a video and I think some of you may have seen it, where a group of men actually, you know, jumped the fence and tried to enter an Indian family's home. Now what do you do? Do you welcome them on a red carpet and say please come in for tea and samosa? No, you're going to protect your family. I would do that. That is self-defense. Now, if you come into my yard with a panga for absolutely no reason, honestly, what do you want me to do? What would you like me to do? That's exactly what happened to some of the people in Phoenix. I'm not saying all those Indians are innocent. I am saying that they were innocent Indians. And then they were those Indians that were probably fueled or paid for by whoever to whatever, you know, to increase this violence. My point is that this entire unrest was pinned on Phoenix at the time. But who burnt the trucks on the N2? Who caused that entire, um, who caused that route not to, not to operate for like two or three days? Um, how did, uh, 300 people did not die in Phoenix. I mean, come on, the morgue does not, I, I haven't been to Phoenix, but I doubt that that Phoenix morgue, morgue stores 300 people. But then you had a lot of people saying that, um, you know, my, my, my brother was there or my father was there or whatever. But what I have to also say is that 
there were some people that came out. I mean, I read reports of some people coming out and saying that um, my brother or son or husband was missing for five days and we found him out. You know, we didn't know that he went missing. You didn't know he went missing until the July unrest happened. And then suddenly you realize, I have a brother. Let me look in the Phoenix morgue. He might be there. But he most likely wasn't there. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? There were people that were actually creating stories just to fuel racial tensions. We didn't need that. Where are the 12, inv uh, the 12 instigators? Where are those people? Whatever happened to uh, Jacob Zuma's daughter, um, Amandla, we see you. Nothing's happened to her. Why has nothing happened to her? Is it because she is the daughter of some powerful or powerful man? or the former president's daughter. So you've got innocent people sitting in jail in Phoenix, uh, the, from Phoenix, but you have Jacob Zuma's daughter sitting in her mansion, sipping her uh, thousand rand champagne and saying, Amandla, we see you. That is inciting violence, but nothing's happened to her because I'm sorry, the politicians in this country are just too shit scared, excuse my language, but they are just too shit scared to do anything to these people. So who, who, who is the actual scapegoat here? It's the, the normal person that walks the streets. Nothing's gonna happen to those Phoenix people, those guys sitting in jail. They're just gonna sit in jail. They're not gonna get their day in court. Nothing's gonna happen to them. They're not gonna get justice, even if they are innocent. They are just going to rot in jail whilst we have people like Jacob Zuma's daughters and sons and I mean, you know, the brilliant, and I'm using that using that word very sarcastically. What's his name? The son? Um, Tuduzani Zuma? Yes. We have him saying, please, um, you know, loot responsibly or whatever it was. And that is the kind of person the rest of South Africa or some of them actually see as president of this country. I mean, come on, you got to wake up. You can't really have that person as president of this country when he says oh please loot responsibly like really how do i walk into a shop and say excuse me i just came here to loot your cabbage <laughs> yeah and people were not hungry i'm sorry people were not hungry we saw people stealing lg tvs and uh and appliances and i mean a couch that was worth like what seventy-two thousand rands that couldn't even fit in their in their in their <laughs> little apartments so people, people were stealing were linen, hungry. yo. They like were <laughs> they were instigated by someone, and that mastermind has not been arrested yet. Until that mastermind is arrested, you are going to continue having parliament burning, uh, carnival city burning, and and God knows what next. So the leader at the top, which is, and it's, you know, it's a humble request to President Cyril, uh, to, to Cyril Ramaphosa, do something because the time to talk is over. I mean, he has spoken for what, four or five years? The time to talk is over. Literally, and I'm sorry to say this to the president, but you really need to grow some balls and start taking action. Because if you don't do that, this country is falling apart. It is falling apart and there are politicians out there that are actually using people, using race to fuel tensions. We can't do that. We can't let that happen. We are South Africans. We pay our taxes. We contribute to this economy. We want every single person to thrive because if you thrive, it makes it, it makes it lesser for, for taxpayers. The burden is lesser on taxpayers. I mean, I heard that they might increase the tax at some point in time. Now we went from 14% to 15%, then to 16%. You need to do something and you need to start acting now. If you're only going to act in two years time or in 2024, that's not going to help because that might actually cost you your presidency. So if you, I mean, I just don't know what it is about politicians. Maybe they just have knives behind each other's back. And, you know, if you do something to this one, then you might be taken out. We've seen what happened to the political killings in, in KZN. And perhaps people are just scared. They are scared. But if you are scared, I mean, what the hell do you think happens to the layman on the street? We are just as scared. We are bloody scared. If a politician is scared, you're walking around, you're roaming around with your blue light brigade, with your 20,000 bodyguards. But here we are trying to tell you, fix the bloody country. 
and protect us as citizens. Are we so concerned about protecting the councillors in KZN and making sure that there aren't any political killings? That's your problem. But what are you doing to protect South Africans? This unrest should never have happened. It happened. They used Jacob Zuma, whether it happened because of him, but they used him as a scapegoat. They're now using the Phoenix residents as the scapegoat. But the bigger thing is that intelligence received a report weeks before, and they literally just sat on it. They sat on it like they were sitting on their toilet paper. I mean, come on, guys. We actually have an intelligence in this country that's not doing anything then you are not intelligent. Scrap your department and stop spending the billions. Lastly, I just wanna say, they've amounted this report or the damages to say 100 billion. And you know, pardon my, my distrust with these people, but I'm not quite sure if it is 100 billion. They could say it's 100 billion. It might actually be a little bit lesser, but I mean, given the past experiences, we had Patricia DeLille building a chicken fence, which probably cost 10,000 rands, but she said it was 33 million. So they're always increasing or inflating the figures because somebody needs to put their hand in that lottery pot and take out what they need. So today we said it's 100 billion, but it could actually just be 50 million. I don't know. The greater loss in this entire thing is not the infrastructure. It is the lives that were lost. So to the people out there that go out and burn infrastructure and destroy, you are actually destroying your own livelihood. Stop it. Stop burning. Stop destroying infrastructure because it's costing you. You're not able to work. You're unemployed. It's going to increase unemployment in this country. So guys, we need to get together and engage in dialogue. It's so easy to pick up you know, a match and some paraffin and burn something and show your frustration, but that doesn't work. It really doesn't work. Engage in dialogue. I mean, there can be peaceful protests. Let's all get together. Imagine if 40 million South Africans got together and stood outside of parliament and said, we're not doing this anymore. We don't care about, you know, um, worshiping politicians or leaders. We want you to look after us, not to look after yourself. And that's my piece. Round of applause. Damn. Um, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> I mean, Xavier, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> you, you can never, you can, you can follow Sunflower. You can never rise above. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try. Um, guys, I've got two ways I can do this thing. I want to do both, if possible. Um, I've actually read the report from government on the presidency site as well as articles. And I think there are 46 articles in the last day or so. So I can choose to do the report quickly, which I'm going to just do. I'm going to do an entire review on my profile as if I'm doing a book review. Um, so that will come later this week. But I can just run over the facts quickly. Uh, a few of you guys have mentioned some things that seem like fact, but are not fact in the report. Uh, and then I can do my lived experience of the events of July 20, 2021. I was there. I wasn't in KZN, but I was there. I was here in South Africa. I experienced it firsthand. <laughs> so which way do you guys think I should go first? Uh, I I, 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 oh, man. I don't know. Should we, should we, should, uh, 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 what are you more comfortable with? Let me start with the report. That's the easy part. Okay. Okay. So... You've noticed the article you sent us, as well as a few other articles. And let's be honest, guys, no South African is going to go read that 146 page report. Um, that's the honest truth. And the media is counting on the fact that you do not read that report. I want to challenge every listener, every person that's watching, every one of the panelists to go read that report, because the first fallacy is the Daily Maverick reports 100 billion in losses. The report only mentions 50 billion. Nowhere is 100 billion mentioned. So Sunflower was close. She said 50 million. She is <laughs> close. Um, so, you know, the, the report. You, you cannot trust them. You, you are being swindled by the media in a big way. I've read 46 articles, I speed read the um, report which is about 146 pages. The last 20 pages are not so important. Um, the first 20 pages, not important, but the, the in-between 
is vital to every South African to understand the real state of the nation and who are the real actual criminals behind the July unrest because it becomes very apparent and you don't need to be part of the security agencies. Okay, so let us start by who compiled the report. So the report was commissioned by Cyril Ramaphosa on the 5th of August. The expert panel had no powers. In other words, that panel and all the information in it was done via cooperation. If nobody cooperated, that information is not included. So these were ministers that submitted their reports, submitted what they had done, did debriefings. These guys, the panelists, actually went ahead and met with all these people. They went to the shopping centers, met with the owners, met with owners of the factories, etc. It's a long list they went through. And that is why from August till now, they hadn't released the report. It took a long while to compile. So you got to understand this report, the people behind it had no power to actually go to the police station and say, I want this information. The police commanders in Phoenix had to cooperate or not cooperate. It was up to them. So it's not like this, this panel had any powers to say, we are getting every bit of information and it will be 100% factual. So you got to understand when you read this report, it's based on whoever cooperated, which was mostly government. And they state that from the onset that it is mostly the ministeri ministers and the ministerial um, departments that cooperated with them to give them the information. So obviously, you know, if the minister of police tells the Phoenix police commander, I need the information from Phoenix, um, that guy's not going to, you know, disobey the minister. Or maybe he might in our country. Um, but anyway, um, you got to understand, and as you read the report, this becomes apparent. Um, Sunflower said it right. Um, the intelligence agencies apparently had this, and the media is reporting it as such, that they had the intelligence for weeks before the unrest actually occurred. Now, we have something called the SSA, which is the Secure, State Security Agency. It's a very powerful agency. It's existed before the apartheid era. Very talented people there. I know some of the people. Um, they actually, from the day Zondo said that um, Zuma must actually go to prison, they were monitoring chatter on every angle and, you know, basically keeping an eye on the situation because they submitted. Now, you guys know that from the 26th of March 2020, the NCCC, was in control of our country. There is no democracy under the NCCC. There is no normal powers under the NCCC, which is the national corona convenience, whatever, whatever, what they, the, the dodgy motherfuckers. Anyway, um, uh, what happened was we had a organization called NICOC, and we have another organization called SSA and another organization called the SNSA. All of these organizations overlap um, to provide security intelligence for the government. Now, the NCC or NCCC, whatever they are, they call themselves, um, they pretty much eliminated all of this. So the NSA, which is like the massive security intelligence agency in South Africa, similar to the Homeland Security in the U.S., to make it simple, um, they haven't set regularly since COVID broke out in 26, uh, 2020. They haven't set regularly. So all of their reports go to the NCCC. The NCCC elected not to take action on this. That is the shocking part of the report, and it's disclosed in the report that the NCCC did not take action and nor could the NSA, because now the NC, NCCC is in control. The NSA has no power over them. So the whole hierarchy of Sir Ramaphosa is the man in charge is not true. The NCCC is in charge. Then you look at, what is it, private security, which was vital. Um, okay, no, let me go back to the police. So in the report, it states that the police from the onset had the perception that like we've become accustomed in the last 27 years of freedom in South Africa, the unrest will take, you know, a few burnt tires on our road. 
few road closures, nothing serious. A couple of hundred people, nothing serious. Now, the term they've coined is called organized spontaneity, right? Which states that it's a new term they've coined in this report, which states that, you know, originally there was a small amount of protesters who were organized and incited. And this then just created a explosion of protesters that were very similar and did the same thing in different provinces. For example, the first truck fires happened on the 8th, and by Monday, behind me is Alexandra. That sky was orange for about four nights during the unrest. And that was the fires burning in Alex. I went there when Becky Sele was there and the military was there, and I just like walked around kind of with them, pretending to be a journalist. So, you know, I was, um, and the gunshots that were happening, I could hear them from here. So, you know, this, this idea that they had that, you know, things just sporadically happened and it's, it's a, a new term they've coined shows that the police were completely overwhelmed. And this shows by the fact that they ran out of rubber bullets. They then relied on private uh, security as well as citizens to supply them with private with rubber bullets so that they could deter them. The perception of what was to come from the police and what actually happened was dramatically different. And the police were overwhelmed from the first day, which was Monday really, uh, of the unrest and they never gained traction. And that is why SANDF had to be brought in. Now the reason SANDF could not be brought in was because there are constitutional restrictions to that stop the president from just calling SANDF and saying, you guys need to go there. The president cannot do that. Now, I myself, living through this whole thing, um, was very angry at the fact that on Monday, the army were not on site. They only arrived the following Monday. And I was like extremely angry about this. When I read the report, I, I, I begin to understand the restrictions in our constitution as well as our government that prevented anyone from doing this. You know, it prevented certain things. The most interesting part, was that the law does not allow private security companies to protect public property. Can you believe that? Wow. A private security agency cannot protect, even if there is serious harm coming to them, they cannot protect anyone that is not their client. That's the legal implications. So even if, and, and this is why a lot of security companies like Sunflower mentioned, have been implicated in criminal cases um, and it, it's purely a legal matter which they did break the law by protecting and blocking off streets which is public property you know that the government didn't order them to do that and, and this is an interesting thing and this is all in the report but the media is singing and dancing to the tune they want us to hear they they know we're not going to read this report so they know we're not going to see this and in none of the articles there are 46 i read in about an hour and speed read me. And none of them mention any of this, not one. So that is the media. We have a political struggle with real politics. And then we have a political newsroom, which is singing their own stories to influence our politics. And this is very dangerous guys. So it's important you try to get your information directly from the government, even though they are liars, they are still lesser liars than the media. Then in terms of uh, uh where was i yes the report does mention racism in phoenix and it mentions specifically that not 300 people but 36 were murdered in phoenix it says specifically that these people were of african origin and that the people that murdered them were of indian origin and this is all very disturbing because if you were speaking to a lot of the people in phoenix yes a lot of um, civilians were protecting their homes. But Phoenix is also home, home to, much like the Cape Flat, a group of organized gangsters. Now, gangsters are not people who are made. They are not decent people who say, you know what, we're just going to protect our territory. They're going to be like, those murderers will kill them. Because that's what they do. We know with Teddy, they said, we're going to kill those two O's that killed Teddy. 
and they killed them in the street, broad daylight, and nobody stopped them. So these are the kind of people that were involved. And then you got security companies who said to say a very small, I'm, I'm talking 0.001% of security companies in South Africa are part of organized crime. That is the reality. It's the legal way to own as many guns as you can and have a license to carry them and use that company to bully your opponents. So a few organized criminals do open security companies, which they use to protect nightclubs, they use to protect shabinis, they use to protect their businesses, and the, the police cannot touch them because it's a legal company. So yes, a few of those companies engaged in, um, let's say, less than legal actions um, to protect and go further than just to protect their environment. They went ahead and started their own aggression towards townships, etc. And Peter Meritzburg was one of them. I think they set a light to an entire township, which thankfully only, I think, a quarter burnt. So you've got all of these factors that are mentioned in the, the report, as well as what they think is the cause. So I'm just going to go through what they say are the contextual issues that you must take notice of when reading the report as to how so basically they're saying these are the powder kegs that set off when a small fire was lit which was zuma's um incarceration and they say it was a multi-crisis of the following a hollowing of state institutions poverty and in what's this inequality unemployment, high rates, spatial planning and specific reference they made to the townships and their proximity to city centers, which was not allowed. You must know that most townships were actually established on the basis of land invasion. And that is why the government is trying to get rid of that because they invade the land, then they demand services. And that is the way it's been going for the last 20 some odd years when they've realized the government caves in and then announces that they are acknowledging that township, even though it's right next to Santon or right next to Four Ways or wherever it is. And then they go on to say rampant corruption. Can you believe a report from government mentions rampant corruption? I was so shocked. They then said frustrations of COVID, which was shocking for me as well, because no one actually blames COVID. You know, people were locked down. and. And at the onset of lockdown, I said they will never lock down the townships. I didn't believe they could. Then SANDF was on the streets kicking the crap out of people because you're not wearing a mask, which I didn't think was possible in my lifetime. So I think a lot of people in KZN were frustrated about what had happened. The report goes on to say that, uh, yeah, Phoenix was mostly blamed, but was not the main uh, cause of the deaths. The deaths were 343 in total, the majority of which, and the report says this, was due to the negligence of looters in their environments. So, for example, 17 people were crushed by beer crates because they tried to loot alcohol. And this was nowhere near Phoenix. The deaths counted, and this is the most shocking part, the deaths counted also include the victims of looting. So, for example, a pastor in Phoenix was trying to protect his community with a few other civilians. There was a drive-by shooting which took his life, and his death is counted in the 340-some-odd deaths. So it makes it seem as if all these people died in the so-called Phoenix massacre. There was no massacre. There was no mass amount of Indians that went out to a township and started hacking people to death. That is what generally is a massacre. These were individual deaths that occurred by people being vigilantes and mostly gangsters being vigilantes who were using illegal weapons to kill people. So, you know, the, the report kind of mentions a lot of this and it, share, it, it squarely places the blame on a few people, mostly government. And it says that the ministers all received, so the Minister of Defense received the report from the NSA and I think there was a serious misunderstanding between the Minister of Police and the Minister of Defense as to what the report entailed. 
So the report mentions that there was no communication between the various ministers to secure the country before anything happened, even though they had knowledge of it. So it squarely places the blame on the executive of our country, not the individual. Can I make departments. a comment there? Yeah. So you're telling me that the Minister of Defense, who was Mapisa Ngakula at the time, right? The reports are out basically almost single singles her out, right? And her reward from the president for this grotesque failure is to simply move her from the Ministry of Defense, where she has failed and cost the country billions. The reward is to move her from defense to tourism now. Is that it? Well, do I, do I, I have that I, right? I, I, no, I think Lendiwe is tourism. I think she's something else and the well, Speaker of Parliament, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Oh, yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, I'm just, sorry. We've, we've been talking about... They've been recycled bit, and, uh, just to destroy another yeah. department. So her I reward is to go from the Ministry of Defence to Speaker of Parliament. Precisely. So, 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 you know, this this report has only come out recently. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Cyril Ramaphosa and the report goes on uh, in its conclusion with suggestions for the president, which he'll never take, um, because the price is too high. And, and you know, I spoke spoke about this to someone I met over coffee and who was interested. And I told him that in my experience of the ANC, um, each figurehead to get where they are, they had their own network of people, which includes patronage. It includes organized crime that supported them. Uh, we know Dlamini Zuma probably has connections to illicit cigarette sales. And that is why she banned cigarettes. So you know each one, and, and this is why the ANC is fractionalized so much. There is no longer a unity because each one has their own house and all. So you think of it more, think of the ANC more like Game of Thrones, which I've never watched, but I know because I followed the memes. Um, but, uh, you know, think of uh, ANC as more of Game of Thrones. Each of them really hate each other. There is no camaraderie. And that idea of the old ANC we know is disappearing, and you see it because of resignations of Tito and Bueni. You see it when Tokyo Sexuale left um, ANC. You see it when certain people are just not interested in a executive position anymore, even though they could be good. You know, so you 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 now faced, especially Cyril Ramaphosa, with the same figureheads you've had for the last twenty years, who you know are probably corrupt. So Fikile is one of them. You know that man is doing strange and wonderful things behind the scenes, but you have no option but to make him a minister. Because if you don't, you will not succeed at the NEC and you will not be president. And you know you South Africa's last hope. Pretty much everyone else thinks you are South Africa's last hope. And that is how Cyril Ramaphosa became president. If you look at the figureheads that have been in from 2009 till date, much of the cabinet is the same, guys. Much of the cabinet is the same. And you cannot say I'm fighting corruption when you still have the same people in there. It's crazy. But this report was, you know, when I read it, I read it with a closed mind thinking this is just going to be government propaganda. And it, it was like a smoking gun by the end of the time I read it. And I was like, geez, the media really writes a bad story. Because if I was a journalist, I'd be ashamed at the articles that are being read, written now. It tells no story, actually. It's telling their own story of a report they never read. So, yeah. Sunflower, you, you wanted to say something. Yes, sorry. Just to say, um, the, yeah, the media will actually make you believe that pigs fly. So, and, and there are stupid people out there that might actually believe what the media says. I just want to quickly just touch base on, on one thing about the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix issue when this entire unrest happened. There were a lot of, um, you know, a lot of messages on social media saying that you Indians are killing us blacks. And I just want to say to those people who did not or do not live in Phoenix or in KZN, that the black and Indian community have been living alongside each other for decades. They didn't need an unrest to walk out onto the street and start killing innocent people. They could have done it without the unrest. 
So that narrative that you were fed as sheep is total BS. Nobody just goes out onto a street and kills black people for the sake of it. People were protecting themselves. And like you've mentioned, Xavier, Indian people also died. Um, there were people that were protecting themselves. And yes, they are Indian security companies. I'm Indian and I'll say it. They are Indian security companies that, um, that engage in criminal activity. I don't know who they are. I don't wish to know who they are, but it is a reality. The point is, um, we as the Indian community did not need to wait for a July unrest to kill innocent black people. Seriously, guys, we do not hate black people. We do not hate white people. We do not hate colored people. We do not hate people. Simple. Um, the, again, I'm saying it that politicians are actually using um, racial divisions to fuel tensions. That's what they're doing. And you are buying into it. You are actually, they're using you. They're using you to, um, to hate each other. And you can stop it. So. Yeah, I think I just needed to put it out there that that the Indian and black community have lived alongside each other in KZN for decades and they still live alongside each other. Um, there was a video that was put out where the uh, during the July unrest, it's somewhere on my timeline where the black community were also saying we are not standing with the Indian community and saying we're not going to let people come into our community and attack us. So how is that possible? I mean, come on, guys, you all have your own brains. Surely you can think for yourself. You really do not need a politician to poison your mind. No, it, it's it's quite true, Sunflower, because, you know, it, and it again comes back to the media, which I think after I always hated the media. Um, I hate it, especially now after reading this report. Um, and I think the media generated that narrative of Phoenix Indians being racist. Let's get to the facts. During the apartheid era, there was the Land Areas Act. Phoenix and Chatsworth are products of the Land Areas Act. Indians, as well as Blacks, were removed from wherever they were staying and packed into Phoenix. They were packed into Chatsworth. They were packed into Malagasy. They were packed into these specific areas, specifically under the apartheid era. And we worked together as Indians, Blacks, Coloreds, in fact, the Freedom Charter that the ANC holds dear, but never actually follows and never actually fulfills the promises on, um, that was written by whites and black. The man, the man that actually typed it out was a white man. And this is the golden document of the ANC. So the, the fallacy that, you know, Indians were above during the apartheid, that is a big lie. The ANC was built up of an Indian party as well as other parties that merged to make the ANC stronger before apartheid fell. And even today, in, in the national government, you'll see a lot of figurehead Indians inside the ANC party who still support the ANC party. I think after the July unrest, a lot of people did not vote for ANC, where they previously would have voted for ANC. Uh, I mean, you know, my parents are both ANC supporters. Uh, I think... When I decided to be a DA member, I was nearly crucified by both my in-laws and my own family. Um, it, it was like a ridiculous, you want to be a racist, uh, you know? So it was like, it was terrible for me because when I told them I'm going to run for counselor and what, they were like, you met, you'll never win a seat. You're going to be completely failed. I was like, Jesus Christ. Okay. So, you know, I think the, the role of Indians in South Africa's independence and freedom after 1994 is largely overlooked, especially by the media. Um, it's, it's, it's a great fallacy of our times. And if you look at the media and how they capitalized on the Phoenix racism issue, you'll see how much money they made just in sales of advertisements for every click on an article. Because people ate this up. I mean, people in Mpumalanga, which were not even involved in any sort of unrest, we're eating this up, yeah, Indians. Yeah, Indian. It's about time. No, what? What is it about time? You've been buying from Indian businesses for years. You've been working in Indian business for years. Yeah. What is it about? 
Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think what uh, both uh, Xavier and Sunflower said tonight uh, about this whole uh, unrest is is on point. And Xavier, thank you for reading so much and enlightening us with the truth of what happened. I'm definitely going to try and read. Uh, 